So, um, very quickly, I was born in India. My parents were missionaries and church planters in India. Uh, when I was still quite young, we returned to the United Kingdom, and my father was a church planter in Scotland. That's where I was brought up. And just in case you didn't know, Scotland is a very different country than England. <laughs> just so you are aware of that. Uh, in my mid-teens, we moved south of the border to work amongst the pagan English. And uh, my father was again a church planter in a very different kind of situation. Uh, in my late teens, early 20s, I trained for the ministry. And I was sent, that's the way our denomination did it, sent to uh, a situation in inner city Birmingham. So the second city in, Birmingham, in Britain, Birmingham. And it was a situation that required a replanting of an old church into a, a given community. And I had done four years theological education at a good English university. And I realized within seven days of being in this situation that my education had to begin all over again <laughs> because I really had no idea how to work in this situation. So it's actually quite a creative location. Uh, that church did grow and uh, it um, started a church plant in other locations. Uh, my wife and I went to lead one of those church plants in suburban Birmingham. Those of you who are familiar with Cadbury's chocolate, uh, we planted a church within smelling distance of Cadbury's. <laughs> uh, so, so we have very sweet smelling services when the wind is in the right direction. Uh, that church has grown and uh, started in our home. Now we worship in a community center and we also operate the community center. So we have a lease on the center for 70 years, costs us one pound a year. And uh, we have two and a half thousand people coming through the center every week. So that's an opportunity for witness and ministry. The church has grown there and is now planting out uh, in other places. So I have a lifelong commitment to passion for uh, church planting. And I was just reflecting the other day I don't know what it's like to be in a declining church. I've never been in one because my expectation is that the Church of Jesus Christ will grow. And fortunately for me, every church I've been in uh, has grown. I want to just briefly give you a, a, a little story which isn't in your notes at all, but just to give you, again, another piece of uh, information because we're dealing with a very theoretical topic today, uh, and I want to give it a, a, a practical context. Um, when I started in the ministry, soon after, um, our denomination had a, a crisis. I won't go into the detail, but we had to start again. There was, it was that kind of serious crisis. And we began again with 25 congregations, very small number of congregations, and very small numbers of people in each congregation. And we made a decision to church plant. That was not a popular decision. <laughs> because if you have 25 small churches, they're all saying to you, we need resources. Why are you spending resources on new plants when we need help? Well, that's what we did. And today, of those 25 churches, actually only 15 still exist. The other uh, 10 of those churches have closed. But in actual fact, we currently now have 50 congregations 
In other words, uh, you can see, you can do the maths, a significant amount of church planting has gone on. And the average size of these congregations is twice what the average size was then. In other words, church planting has been an incredibly important way of renewing a denomination, a network of churches. We just had a conference uh, to decide what the next period would be. And the leaders at this conference said, our next plan must be to be a hundred congregations. That took 30 years. They, their plan is for this to take three years. It's the first time I've ever been upstaged in optimism. <laughs> It was a shock. I, I think I'll write a book about it. Um, interesting. It's a completely different atmosphere because the leaders are the church planters. And they have a completely different way of looking at things. Many of the church planters are actually um, from ethnic minorities. So we have uh, a very gifted Ethiopian church planter. We have a very gifted Eritrean church planter, a, a very gifted Zimbabwean church planter, a very gifted Indian church planter, many, many ethnicities who come alongside uh, some Anglo-Saxons and have reimagined the denomination around church planting. And many of these church planters from other lands um, have given up a great deal to be in Britain. Let me tell you about my friend from Ethiopia. In Ethiopia, he was a wealthy man. His father owned huge land and properties. And when he was getting ready to be married, he said to his prospective wife, you see me now, I am wealthy but soon I will be poor. So don't marry me unless you want to be married to a poor man. She said, why are you going to suddenly be so poor? He said, because the Lord has called me to be a missionary in England and I'm going to support myself. That's costly. She did marry him. She's a wonderful woman. And now they have children. And my friend says, with my limited English, I cannot reach many English people. But I say to all the members of my congregation, do not teach your children to speak Amharic, because they are going to be the missionaries to the English. That's costly. To give up your inheritance financially, to give up your inheritance culturally, to give up your inheritance linguistically, to be a missionary and for your children to be missionaries, that's costly. Now, what I'm going to say in uh, this next session, which is, is there's a lot of theory here, um, I say because all of my friends who are ethnic church planters whether they're Ethiopians or Eritreans or wherever they're from, they always say to me this, Martin, although they actually say Dr. Robinson, but I prefer them to say Martin. Uh, Martin, help us to understand why these people think the way they do. And they mean English people. Why, why do English people think like this? It's so strange to us. Why do they think this way? So what I'm going to say in the next few minutes is my attempt to help my friends, my fellow church planters, understand why English people, and let's, let's extend that and say why many Europeans, not all Europeans, but why many Europeans think the way they do.
And I want you to be thinking as we're doing this, which is a piece of theory, just make some notes. How could I apply this in my setting? Okay, how could I apply this in my setting? And that will be the basis for some discussion later. Okay. So, we're talking about a Europe, and you're familiar with the phrase that we are post-Christian. I'm sure you're familiar with that designation. What people sometimes forget is that Europe is increasingly not just post-Christian, but post-secular. Now, what does that mean? Let's just explore that. It's taken us some time to realize that um, Europe, which was the great sender of missionaries, is now the mission field. It's taken us a while to realize that. But we do, we do know it. We don't necessarily know what to do about it, but we do know that that is true. It's a remarkable turnaround because the mission movement which Europe has helped to create, to sponsor, is now fantastically successful all around the world, in Africa, in South America, in many parts of Asia. The mission movement that we from Europe inspired is gaining ground at, at an astonishing pace. And actually, we ourselves didn't even expect it. You know, uh, there was a conference in 1910 in Edinburgh, and they looked at, you, uh, at Africa, and they said, oh, Africa is going to go Muslim. We'll do what we can, but Africa is going Muslim. There's nothing we can do about it. <laughs> Interesting, Africa didn't go Muslim. Actually, not only has Africa increasingly chosen for Christ, but now the Christian movement is, is beginning to move into North Africa. And we're seeing Muslims uh, beginning to be Christians. Well, Europeans didn't imagine that was even possible. So much is happening that we didn't think was possible. And in the midst of that astonishing success, we face the tragedy that our own nations have become a mission field. So what are we to make of that? Um, that shift in culture has been going on for some time, and mission is no longer from the West, but now it's from everywhere to everywhere. And we're used to the idea that in Europe now we have uh, missionaries from nearly every country on Earth. Uh, we even have missionaries um, who are themselves Afghans working amongst other Afghans in Europe. It's an astonishing situation. But the point about all of that is this. We know that the West is a mission field, but it's a unique mission field. There is no other mission field like it. And the methodologies, the approaches that have worked in other places are not necessarily going to work in Europe. I recently was speaking with an African and he said to me, he was an Anglican, he was brought in by an Anglican bishop to be a missionary in rural England. And he said, the problem with these people, his congregation were mostly over 70 years of age, mostly women. He said, the trouble is they don't know how to dance. <laughs> if I could teach them to dance, then they could do mission. I didn't like to say to him that this actually might not be successful. <laughs> um, it wasn't successful. Uh, but it does take a little time to figure out that actually what works in other continents might not necessarily work uh, in a European context. It's a unique mission field. And one of the reasons it is unique is because we have once been Christian. We have once been Christian. In fact, our culture at its deepest levels has been formed by Christianity. In fact, you could even go further and say the very name and identity Europe has only come into being because of Christianity. 
It is not a geographic reality. If you look at uh, Europe on a map, you can see why Africa is a continent. You can see why America is a continent. You can see why Australia is a continent. Why is Europe a continent? It's just a peninsula of Asia. But actually, Europe is defined entirely by the Christian faith. The Christian faith defines the boundaries of Europe. That's why so many people are worried about Turkey becoming a member of Europe. Geographically, this should be no problem. But culturally, historically, there's a huge problem. Because Europe has been defined by Christianity. So we have been Christian. And we have turned away from Christianity on such a scale that actually revisiting Christianity is a huge challenge. So Europe is increasingly described as a culture of post, post Christendom. That is to say, we've turned our back on the civilization created by Christianity to such an extent that the European Union in its recent constitution could not even bring itself to mention that Christianity had once existed. All mention of Christianity was forbidden. We are post-Christian in the sense that um, the majorities of people are no longer active in church life, in Christian commitment. So it's, it's both at a cultural level and at the level of personal commitment that we are post, post-Christendom, post-Christian. But we're also post-modern. And postmodern has helped us to view the world in a particular way. We'll come back to what that might mean in a minute. Increasingly, though, we are post-secular. We're going to explore what that means in a moment. And the language of post is really all about saying, um, we have arrived at a position where we cast doubt upon that which we used to believe. That's what the language of post means. We are simply critiquing, we are casting doubt. And so it's curious that sociologists are now saying we're post-secular. In, in other words, the thinkers in Europe are now increasingly saying that the secular solutions to Europe's problems have not worked. And that conclusion is reinforced by the fact that in a whole variety of ways God is back in Europe in some fascinating ways. And let me just explain two ways in which God is back in Europe. The first way is that uh, many, many people from other nations are arriving in Europe. And they are definitely not secular in their way of thinking. The overwhelming majority of people who come to Europe from other lands have God at the center of their conversation, imagination, and culture. Whether they be Hindu, or whether they be Buddhist, or whether they be Muslim, or whether they be Christian. And actually, by the way, the majority are Christian. God is re-entering the public square, the conversation. First of all, through migration. And that's a shock <laughs> for those who are migrants who can't understand why Europeans aren't interested in God because God is a very interesting subject to most migrants. Well, why don't you talk about God? It's one of the first things that's spoken about in every other culture. Well, why don't you do that in Europe? They want to know. And because they ask that question, actually it raises the question. In fact, two economists in Europe have written a book called God is Back. And they've written it actually as, strictly speaking, as economists because they're saying to Europeans, wake up. The rest of the world is not becoming less religious, it's becoming more religious. And you, Europeans, are in danger of being so out of touch with the rest of the world that you won't be able to communicate with them. 
just from an economic point of view, you need to wake up. God is back. And that conversation is going to be increasingly important if we want to trade, if we want to communicate, if we want to converse with other cultures, we need to understand how they think. God is back. But God is back also in another kind of way for Europeans because actually, strangely and interestingly, as we'll see in a moment, Europeans are actually asking profoundly religious questions without knowing that's what they're doing. So let me begin to explain that. The language that's used by Europeans is to say we're spiritual but we're not religious. I constantly have people say to me when they when I perhaps meet them in our community center and they know what my occupation and interest is, they will say, oh, well, I'm not a religious person. It's curious, we often marry people in the center. We say we only do Christian weddings. And they say, okay, well, we're quite interested in a Christian wedding as long as you understand that I'm not religious. <laughs> now, of course, I want to say, well, in the sense that you mean it, I'm not religious either. But they often say, but I'm spiritual. It's curious, isn't it? Because in times gone by, there wouldn't have been a tension between those ideas. To be religious was to be spiritual, to be spiritual was to be religious. But now there is a distinction. So what is the distinction? Well, the distinction is simply this, that those who object to the tag religious are thinking <coughs> of the institutional expression of spirituality and their experience of the institution is, this is boring. This is not related to my life. This is about a culture which I don't understand. This is about something which is remote. This is about um, people exercising power. It's not about the questions that concern me and my life. That transformation, that dislocation between religious themes and spiritual themes took place somewhere in the 1960s. Something happened in the 1960s. One uh, uh, person describes it this way, the sociologist Callum Brown has written a book called The Death of Christian Britain and uh, he claims to know the precise day and hour on which Christian Britain died. It's a very interesting read. <laughs> I don't think he's right by the way, but he is right to say that something significant happened in the 1960s and one way of describing it is this, the generation that arose in the 1960s, the generation of the Beatles, the generation of Bob Dylan, the generation of the Rolling Stones, the generation that is sometimes referred to as the Boomers, the generation that was the first generation ever to face life as teenagers, not as people just going from childhood to adulthood, as teenagers who had economic power and who had no worries about their future in terms of employment and finance, that generation had a curious experience. And, and here's one way of thinking about it. One author who visited Woodstock, the pop festival, said this. He said, I have witnessed a generation having a religious revival akin to the second great awakening but without God. I think that's actually quite a sharp insight. I think that's what happened to that generation in the 60s. They were actually encountering religion or spiritual experiences to put it another way but God didn't enter into that. It was actually a search for the spiritual accompanied by a rejection of God. Now actually I don't think ultimately that makes sense 
but that's what was being attempted. And it was powerful. It was powerful in its impact on culture. It was powerful in its, in, in its impact upon the arts. It was powerful in its impact on uh, every aspect of Western life. So much so that that generation, the 60s generation, has redefined every decade that they've lived in. They've redefined what it meant to be a teenager. In fact, they invented the term. They redefined what it meant to be living in your 20s, in your 30s, in your 40s, in your 50s. And they're still at it. Mick Jagger and Paul McCartney are about to redefine what it means to be living in your 70s. We never imagined when we were in our 20s that people would be doing world tours as pop stars in their 70s. <laughs> but they are because they're continuing to redefine every decade they've lived in. What happened in the 1960s was actually quite important for Western culture, and it's important that we understand it. One author puts it this way. He says, the 1960s were a period of decisive change in the religious history of the Western world, including not only Western Europe, but also the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. In the 1950s, the great majority of the people in all Western countries were at least nominal members of one of the Christian churches. In the long 1960s, all of this was changing. Nearly every Western country saw a drop in church going, and in some cases, the drop was dramatic. Actually, in many, many European countries, church attendance halved within a single decade. Something was going on. And that something was a huge cultural shift. It wasn't just um, the institution of the church that was being questioned. All institutions were being questioned. As a matter of fact, uh, when politicians lecture the church on how irrelevant they are, just remind them that most political parties have lost more members than the church. They forget that. It's actually all institutions that are being questioned. Modernity itself, the foundations of the Western world, science, and reason are all under suspicion. Other worldviews and religions, other religions, are being explored. We have moved in the last 50 years from being those who produce things to those who consume things. And that gives you a different experience of your environment. We have abandoned any attempt to understand the world through a single big story. The, the, the uh, sociologist and philosopher, uh, French uh, priest actually, Michel de Sertou, describes it this way. He says that today people simply live by small stories that he calls it making do. They use small stories by which they interpret their own immediate life the lives of their immediate family, their immediate friends, their immediate circumstances, recognizing that the small stories they live by do not explain the whole world, but actually they think it's impossible to understand the whole world. The stories people live by today are small stories, and it's just the means by which they get by. Now, I want to argue that something new has been happening in Europe in the last five years, and this is incredibly important for church planters, so listen up. <laughs> I think there is a search for a new story, and we can see that uh, in research that's been undertaken in terms of um, the way in which people experience uh, their environment. So, uh, for example, um, there's a kind of understanding that well, one of the key questions that can be asked by a researcher is, when you look at the world around you, do you see events as purely random, or do you think there's a pattern to them? And interestingly, um, since 1987, between 1987 and the year 2000, the number of people that see a pattern to events, which is, which is a spiritual way of encountering the world, has pretty much doubled. And when you look at the other questions that these same researchers ask, uh, do you sense that there is um, God present in the world? Um, do you have an experience of God, of prayers being answered? Do you 
sense when you look at nature that nature is more than just um, material things, that there's a sacred um, element to nature. When you um, uh, experience uh, death, um, and do you think there's more to death than simply uh, a dead body? Um, are you aware that there's evil in the world? All of these questions, if you add up the total responses to these questions, the number of people who start to see things uh, through spiritual eyes has doubled in the last 13 years in Western Europe. Now that's a very interesting shift. And it's a, it's a shift that we need to be aware of um, as church planters wanting to connect with these populations. Some recent research uh, was undertaken by Coventry Cathedral and, and this was um, undertaken amongst people who report that they are religious, or sorry, that they are spiritual people but not attending church. Spiritual people but not attending church. And what the researchers discovered was that there were a whole series of ways in which these people looked at the world which speak of points of connection for us between the way they're looking at the world and what we might want to say about the gospel. In other words, these people um, are asking questions that come from a sense of awe and wonder about the world in which they live. These are people who have um, a deep concern about destiny. In other words, where are things headed? These are people who are looking at the world and wanting to ask questions about purpose and meaning. Not just where are things headed, but what is the meaning in all of that? These are people who are asking questions about where do we come from? And does where we come from somehow connect with where we might be going to? They have an awareness that there is something out there that's bigger than themselves. And here's the one that I think is most interesting of all. They have a feeling that although they might have a sense of awe and wonder and mystery, they have a feeling that though they might sense that there's a God out there, a presence that's bigger than them, they also have this sense there's something wrong with the world. They don't use the word sin. But actually, that's what they're talking about. There's something wrong somewhere. There's something broken. There's something that, that needs to be somehow healed and put together. They're concerned about the suffering they see around them. And interestingly, for the first time, God doesn't get the blame. It's not necessarily God's fault that there's suffering out there. They're just puzzled about it. Why is it there? And what could be done, be, what could be done about it? Well, that does lead us to ask the question then, is spirituality better than religion? Well, I'm going to argue that uh, uh, it isn't. <laughs> um, and there is a danger, actually, that spirituality can become just another part of the consumer story. You know, you consume goods of various kinds. Why not just consume a bit of religion? In fact, why not search for the church that meets your needs? Safe in the knowledge that if it ceases to meet your needs, you can go and find another church that meets your needs better. This is the consumer drive. Well, spirituality, strangely enough, doesn't work like that. Christian spirituality has at its center a system of ethics that isn't necessarily contained in spirituality by itself. Now, let me explain what I mean by this. Just recently on television, there was um, a debate between uh, an Anglican bishop, a Church of England bishop, and many people who had a whole range of other beliefs. Some of them were witches, some of them were uh, druids, some of them were all kinds of uh, weird and wonderful beliefs. And after a time, one of them got so frustrated with the bishop that he said to him, Bishop! You keep talking to us about ethics. What on earth has religion to do with ethics? 
Now, from the point of view of paganism, that's exactly accurate. Paganism and ethics aren't necessarily connected. In fact, that goes all the way back to the prophets of Baal. Because that was the issue, wasn't it? We believe in a God who cares about the poor, who cares about the marginalized, who cares about the suffering, who cares about children, who cares about those who might otherwise be sacrificed on altars. Our God has a bias towards justice, which presupposes an ethical framework. Spirituality by itself doesn't need ethics, but Christianity is insistent that you can't worship God without taking justice seriously. Now, what has happened in Western Europe, and this is, again, I think it's very important in terms of making connection with people, is that many, many people um, have experiences of God, but no longer have a language with which to speak about those experiences. People have experiences of God, but no longer have a language to speak about those experiences. And one of our gifts, one of our tasks in terms of mission is to help people find a language, a vocabulary with which they might take the experiences of God that they're having and make sense of those experiences. So the challenge for the church is this. First of all, reason is not enough. We've tended to live in the world of reason ourselves. We've tended to lose sight of, a, of the spiritual treasures that we ourselves have from the past, so much so that when people look at the church, they don't imagine that churches are spiritual places. Isn't that curious? We have been in the past, but we've lost connection with those spiritual treasures. One of our challenges is actually to develop spiritual practices. We've had so much emphasis on what we believe that we've lost connection with what we do in terms of our spiritual practices. It's very important to bring that back. We need to bring back for people the experience of God alongside the knowledge of God. One of the most successful courses, as you well know, uh, in Europe today, in terms of leading people to Christ, is the Alpha Course. The Alpha Course is actually no different to many, many other courses, except for one thing. It brings an experience of God alongside knowledge of God. And for Europeans who see themselves as spiritual people, that's actually incredibly important. I'm not arguing against reason. I'm not arguing against knowledge. I think those are incredibly important. But knowledge, reason, and experience of God belong together. I actually think this is an incredible time of opportunity. And I think that in terms of taking advantage of this time of opportunity, church planting is probably the single most significant tool we have if we want to bring experiences of God alongside uh, the European populations that we see around us. We're living between ages at this moment in time. The consumer narrative, which has dominated so much of Europe, is actually weaker than most people imagine. There's an unanswered longing amongst a whole generation of people. Just recently, uh, uh, one of my students uh, did a piece of research among 20-somethings that no longer, or, well, have never attended church, actually. And here's what they discovered. They were asked th this question. Um, what is it that you most value? And here's what came back. The highest value they had was to find relationships of trust lived in community. Relationships of fidelity, faithfulness, lived in community. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Because actually, when they were also asked the question, if you thought you could have 
faithful relationships lived in community, what would you be willing to sacrifice to have that? And they said, if we thought we could have that, we would move home, we would change jobs, we would take a cut in salary, we would do almost anything to have that. Now, I don't know about you, but relationships of fidelity lived in community sounds to me a little bit what the church ought to be. Can you imagine if we were able to present a living experience of relationships and community lived in fidelity as part of the process of planting churches, wouldn't that be amazing? I think we live in a time of fantastic opportunity in Europe. And church planting is the, the way in which we can see that opportunity realized.